Hi folks, it's David here, just asking you for a wee favour. If you don't mind, could you follow us on Apple Podcasts, Android or Spotify, wherever you listen to the show? It's a huge help for us. They might ask you if you want to leave a review. If you could leave a nice one, we'd be very, very grateful. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast. My name is David Edgar. As usual, I am your host. Not as usual, it's my name. As usual, I'm, you get where I'm coming from. Joining me this week to discuss Rangers' march into the quarterfinals of the Scottish Cup is Colin McMillan. Hello, Colin. Hello, David. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. How are you feeling after you were up late watching the Super Bowl? I was, yeah. Um, it wasn't the best of games, was it? But... Um, it got good. It certainly finished strongly and it was an enjoyable night. A few beers on a Sunday night is not to be sniffed at. It was a great game if you are really into NFL. For the once a year crowd, probably not, no, because defences were on top for a large part of it. But uh, well, I absolutely fall into that crowd. I'm a once yeah, a year man. Yeah, but one for the purists is probably how you'd describe But there was a lot to appreciate otherwise. But as you say, it was exciting rather than the blow it. They're the worst ones. Anyway, people aren't here to hear about the NFL. They are here to hear about the Rangers, the most important side in world sport. And at the weekend, we welcomed Air United to Ibrox. Colin, it's a year today since Rangers beat Park. Arctic Thistle 3 2, the infamous give them a goal game. And you and I were discussing before we came on air how much more sedate and professional Rangers feel these days. And it was a good comparison point, I think, because it's true with this Rangers lineup at the moment, you it starts from the top, doesn't it, with the authority which the manager has and the yeah, you can talk about desire. Every manager desires to win, but the the way he breaks the game down, nice and simple. And Saturday was an example of that. A match we should win. We took care of fairly straightforwardly. He made seven changes. He rested players. He gave minutes to guys coming back from injury. It was sort of textbook as to what something like this is supposed to be. It's it's how I grew up going to Rangers games, David, under Walter Smith, and then under Dick Advocat for. A, a long time anyway, you, you went with an expectation that it was pretty much going to go our way and we were going to get the result. And you didn't really go into many matches with the fear, certainly not domestically. Um, I think over the last couple of years, we've almost kind of systemized ourselves into this might go wrong, this might be tricky, this might be a banana skin for us when on paper, when you really think about it as matches it really shouldn't have been. And you're right, it's, this is all down to our manager. I think there's a good argument that it's our first real manager, our first real experienced manager since Walter the second time. And that's not to disrespect anybody that's came before him, but just in terms of he knows his job, he knows what his job entails, and he knows how to do it. And not only does that, he's actually delivering it. And that's what's leading to this newfound, almost zen-like experience of going to Ibrox. Look at since the winter break, how many times have we came off that winter break full of confidence just to be brought back down to earth right away? <laughs> this time, five matches, um, five wins, four clean sheets, and everything's pretty much hunky-dory. And that's after a transfer window, he was a bit unhappy at the end of it. So things are good. Um, we're in a title race. We're through to the next round of the Cup. And it's good fun again going to Ibrox and you go with anticipation and enjoyment rather than trepidation. And I'll take that all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we did get a bit of entertainment at the weekend, primarily from Oscar Cortez. He came in for his first start. And uh, look, We'll caveat it right at the start by saying we are aware, obviously, of the level of opposition. Uh, although I thought Air United did play quite well, to be honest. But uh, I, I I just like the look of him. He's direct, he's pacey, very, very quick. Um, Two-footed, which is helpful. He can go inside and have a shot. And we saw that very early on with an excellent effort that clipped the outside of the post. But he can also get to the byline as well. And, and he should have had a penalty in the first half. Um, I, I couldn't believe... At the time, it happened right in front of me. I couldn't believe it wasn't given. I certainly couldn't believe it wasn't given by VAR because the idea of, well, he gets the ball, yeah, but he takes the man out completely before he's even got near the ball. It's the stonewall penalty kick. 
Yeah, absolutely is. And it, you know what? His performance would have, would have deserved something like that because for the 60 minutes or so he was on the pitch, he was he was a, a real delight. Um, he, st- he stood out um, amongst all the players on Saturday. He, What I like about him is a few things I like about him. I like that he isn't just a winger that you're going to see stuck to the side of the pitch. He, he likes to cut in. When he's not got the ball, David, also, he gets central. It's like he wants to win about the goals. He wants to get through the middle. His movement's really good. Um, he's taken a couple of knocks. In games as well, uh, a head knock in, in both of his first two sub appearances, and he just shrugged, tapped his head, and off he went. He just he throws himself in a wee bit, and he doesn't seem scared. Um, he likes to challenge a man. He likes to take it past somebody. We we like a Colombian that excites us, don't we? Um, if you can tough. As much. you mentioned there, we know Colombians. You know they they don't mind the physical side of football. Absolutely. And if he can excite us half as much as the previous one did, then we're on to a winner here. But yeah, early doors and obviously it's sub appearances and it's a 60 minute um, game against Air United. But it's all looking good so far in terms of Cortes for me. Yeah, set up the opening goal, um, Borna Barisic. Um, Borna doesn't score as often as you probably think he should, you know, given given his left foot. Um, but he, he got on the end of that one, deflection into the net. And I think we, we sort of expected the floodgates to open, and it didn't, which was a tribute to, to Air United, without ever really causing us any problems, I felt. I mean, I, I genuinely can't remember Jack having anything to do. You know, they had a wee flurry of corners in the first half. Mm-hmm. Connor Goldson said afterwards, 10 minutes before half time, we maybe stepped off it a bit, but reset at half time, came back out. And it was really just about a question of getting the second to to put it away. Uh, eventually it did come with the excellent Todd Campwell, who, who was given a bit of a rest. He came on and he has been playing really well lately. Uh, it, for me, I know he'd got goals before it because he's he's on a good scoring run but for me it was the game against Hibs and he had to come off actually straight away with an injury but that goal seems to have let something in him we're getting back to the Todd that we saw this time last year um, a big part of that he has said is the manager is asking him to do different things but maybe not be on the ball quite as much but get into better positions and therefore be more dangerous so it's a wee case of less is more it's maybe less possession, but it's it's more time spent in areas he can hurt the opposition. And then when he does get the ball, as we saw at the weekend, he's in a position to, to use that skill and and to get his you know, goals and numbers and assists. Uh, I know it won't go down as an assist at the weekend, but it really was an assist. Yeah, he's. I think he's benefiting as well, David, from the fact that we've now got a couple of newer players and a couple of players back fit that take a little bit of the... The work off of him as well. Everything doesn't have to go through Todd Cantwell anymore. He doesn't have to be the only creative player in the final third or in the midfield or wherever he might be playing at that point. Um, in terms of the the work he's done with the new manager, I think there's some kudos to be given to both of them, really. Um, we saw the manager being brave enough to take Todd Cantwell off when it wasn't working. He took him off at half-time, I think. He took him off early doors in a couple of matches. 35 um, minutes against Aris, yeah. That's the one, yeah. Um and you know Todd Cantwell is a, a he's a character that thrives on confidence. He thrives on the crowd. He could, that could have went one or two ways with him, but he's he's taken it in the right way. He's listened to the feedback, obviously. He's listened to what the manager actually does want him to do, and he's came back a better player. And you know what, a better teammate as well. And I think there's a lot of kudos to be given to both of them for that because it's, it's something that could have went it easily went the other way and it didn't. And now we're benefiting from it, and we are seeing. The Todd Cantwell of old, the Todd that excites us, the Todd that we rely on, rather than the Todd that was maybe overplaying it a little bit too much and trying to do too much and then taking three or four touches when only need to take two, which we saw a lot of from him. So yeah, it's good stuff and it's long may it continue with Todd because when he's on form, he's so, so important to us. Something I like about the manager is first of all his attitude, which is he doesn't really t- and he doesn't he doesn't really talk about problems focuses on finding solutions and he's he said that that that's kind of his philosophy and he does and I think that extends into with players he doesn't worry too much about what they can't do he he tries to obviously minimize them being put in areas where their skill set isn't up to it and instead what he does is focuses on what they can do which is obviously sensible but it's amazing how many managers ask players to do things they're not capable of. He doesn't do that. He looks and he says, right, you're very good at this, so we need to get you in a position where 
you're going to have a chance to express that you're not so good at this side of the game so we maybe need to work on that and you see the results for example didn't play at the weekend but Ross McCausland whose defensive side of the game was very weak and it's coming on you you see it um, almost month by month you see the improvement in that but it, it, it tends to me to be a focus on the positive and just just highlighting a player's strengths and minimising their weaknesses, as opposed to saying, no, I need you to do this complete all-round job. And I think that we have been too prone to that before with previous managers, where you need to get the bit, I suppose, money ball. You know, right, well, what, what is he good at? Let's let's get him somewhere in the team where he can actually do that. And, and that's what he's doing. Yeah, it just goes back to that point that he's, he's a manager that he knows what his job entails. He knows what to do. He's been around this, and importantly, he's won. He's a winner before David. He knows what it takes to win games, to win titles, to win competitions, and he knows you have to do that with these players. I, I, I'd argue there's maybe no greater example of that uh, than Dejon Sterling, a guy who was hardly featuring for us. He was in a position where he was very going to struggle to get game time, but the manager identified something in him and thought he could maybe do more in midfield, brought him into there. And look how much of a revelation he's been when he plays there now. You now see mm-hmm. him as a central midfielder rather than the position we bought him in. And that's, I think, down to the manager recognising we're short in midfield, but we've got this guy who you might not automatically think is a right fit for there. But let's try it. Let's talk him through it. Let's try and get him in that position. And now we've got him there and we've got that extra person that can play there for us now. Yeah, definitely. And, and the fact that the manager has allowed Jose Cifuentes to leave indicates exactly what you're saying, that he stopped seeing Dujon Sterling as a stopgap and now sees him as, well, he can play there, so we'll just use him in that position. And, and I like that. It's, I suppose it's something modern coaching, and I, I use the term because I agree with what you said earlier about he's a manager, um, a more all-rounder. The, in modern coaching, there's, I think, a very big thing on set ideals. You know, how often do we hear a manager say, this is my philosophy, and, and it's rigid, and it sticks. Now, obviously, if you don't stand for anything, then you'll fall down, and, and I get that, and managers need to have an overarching idea. Um, and I think at times it was hard to tell, for example, with a geo team exactly what it was he, he envisaged it being. But then you get other managers who I think are far too set, and I'd, I'd probably put Beal in this category, and tied to doing certain things certain ways. I don't get that impression from Clement. I think he sort of looks at what he has, Colin, and goes, right, these are the, these are the ingredients I have, basically. What's, what's the best recipe I can come up with for them? Um, that doesn't mean that you can't, as I say, work on a player's individual weaknesses, and it doesn't mean you can't sign players to do something to take you in a, you know, a direction that's maybe clearer to where you want to go. But I, I just think that that open-mindedness is a big thing. And I think the fact that he is very focused on, right, we need to get the result. What's the best way to get the result? There are echoes of Walter there. Um, I think, but you can see the difference that he's made in the team. We get the ball forward a lot quicker. That doesn't just mean long balls. It means that we we play forward. We don't do lateral passes constantly. He doesn't allow the team. I've seen him roaring from the touchline when it when the team has done that too often. He likes his playing through. He likes people getting to the byline, and and you can see the difference that it's made. And and you mentioned earlier the atmosphere at Ibrox. I think a big part of that is. The, the football is less turgid, for want of a better word. Yeah, it's, it's more enjoyable. You're not just seeing 30, 40, 50 crosses a game getting headed away by opposition six foot two defenders. Um, we've seen that for all far too long, the, the dreaded horseshoe and all that chat. It's not like that anymore. You can actually see a team that's trying to play football. They're trying to be progressive. They're trying to actually make probing forward thinking passes they're trying to be at aggressive and that's what you want a Rangers team to be doing he's he's really good I think David in terms of his team selections at times I think sometimes when the team news comes out an hour before kickoff or so at first glance you sometimes look at it and you think all oh, right I'm not really sure about that but then you think about it and you realize exactly why he's picked the players he's picked for the opposition and that's something he does very well he doesn't just pick the best 11 Rangers players on paper every single game. He picks the best 11 for the team we're playing, be that bringing Borna in if he's been up, going up against a bigger team, um, putting Ryan Jack in in a game where he wants to get better control of the midfield, um, being more attacking against like Aberdeen. He played a really attacking lineup against Aberdeen, which right, yeah. 
didn't always expect, but he thought he could outdo them that way, and it worked. It's really, really tactical, really, really clever, and it's not just a case of, I've got these 11 players they need to play, which is kind of what we've been seeing, we've relied on the same players playing every single game for far too long, and it wasn't working. He's used in the squad. Um, he's spoken a lot about how every single player in his squad has got a, a role to play in his story, and he's going to use them all. And you know what? To his word, he is doing that. He's using the players when he sees right. He's giving players rest when he thinks they need it. And so far, it's all working. He's not made any faux pas or messed anything up. Yeah, I think you can do that if you have a structure because I think too often, you know, the last couple of years, we've basically been relying on one of the good players will do something yes. to, to, to get as a goal, to get as the win. You know, it will be Tav or Kent or Morelos or Cantwell. One of them will do something and that'll be enough. Um, I think it's, it's a lot more... I don't want to say easier because he asks a lot of the players, but I think it can be simultaneously um, difficult and easy. It's difficult in the sense that you need to work hard on a Philippe Clement team. You you need to run your balls off. You need to do everything that he asks of you, but that he doesn't over. He simplifies what it what it is he's asking from you. I think players respond to to straightforward guidelines. I think we can overload players. I think it's a bit of a curse of the modern game, and the top players can do it you know, the elite players. But I think that, you know, with with lesser players who maybe don't quite have their football brain, and there's nothing wrong in that, by the way, that any sport, the elite have got something, you know, that a kind of sporting intellect that, that mortals don't have, that you simplify it, you give them defined roles, you tell them that you expect them to work very hard in those defined roles. But you're right, players can come in and, and they can they can add to that. I want to talk about some individual players then, Colin, um, from the weekend. The first one is Fabio Silva, who's maybe turning out to be a slightly different type of player than than we thought. I think there's always that assumption in us as, as Scots that when we see someone arrive from... Uh, you know, from abroad, from somewhere with better weather, which isn't that hard. Um, you know, the long hair and flexible. I knew you were going to say long hair. I was waiting to say that as well. Yeah, yeah. The, the, it, it's a caricature, you know, it but is. the flicks and tricks and you think, oh, he won't fancy this, you know, in Scotland. And, and opposition play. Look, we've used that ourselves when we've had teams coming over for European games. You, oh, they won't fancy it tonight when the, the wind's howling and we're in their faces. Um, so I suppose it's it's only common sense that teams in Scotland use it. But he's not like that at all. I mean, physical side of the game does not bother him in the slightest. He'll, he'll get involved in it. He'll take a kick, doesn't bother him. He'll work hard. He runs constantly. He'll put tackles in. And on top of that, that's a couple of goals in the week, both of which were really good striker finishes. Now, I've mentioned before on here that he doesn't strike me as a traditional number nine, and he doesn't. But he clearly has a striker's instinct in front of goal. Both those finishes, the one last week and the one against Air at the weekend, were reacting to a situation, nearing the box, being alive, and getting there to turn it into the net. Yeah, absolutely. He's He is going to score goals for us. He's, he's not going to score... 20 goals or anything like that. That's not the type of striker it is. There's there's more to him than that. But yeah, if you put a good opportunity in his way, he's got the, the finesse and he knows where to put it and he's shown that already. I've been really impressed with him, David. I, I like I like him. I like how he came right in and he's, I think his debut was against him, Barton in that awful weather, that awful pitch. Yeah. He came on and you'd have thought, he, he must have got a bit of a culture shock coming on to that and thinking, well, what have I done? Where have I ended up? How has this happened to me? But he, he he played quite well during that game. There was, I remember a particular spell down the left hand side. I think he he, he he linked up with. I can't remember. He played a one two with somebody right into the box, and when the wind was moving the ball, it was just awful. And that's what right away I like this guy. I've been impressed with how much he tracks back, David. I've been impressed with how much he tries to win balls. He he's not your lazy forward waiting for the ball to come to him at all. Um, I don't think the manager would let him in the team that did that. To be fair, but he just doesn't do it. He's he's right into it, and he he's playing like he's got a point to prove, you know. And you know, in some ways, maybe he does. He's got that big transfer fee hanging over his head. He's never really worked for him at Wolves. He's had a couple of loans. Um, he's still now getting loaned out again in twenty twenty four. He's he, he wants to maybe do something here. He wants to win something. He wants to set himself up again for whatever he, the next part of his story goes. So I've really enjoyed seeing him, and. He's not the 20 goal a year, a year striker, 30 goal a year striker that maybe some people wanted, but I think he's a guy that's going to contribute. 
um, both in front of goal and creatively. He's going to get assists. And you saw the other the other night in um, in injury time how good he was at running the clock down, how good he was at holding the ball. Yeah, against Aberdeen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just just how good he is in in, in that regard. I guess I said it earlier that but Cantwell's became a really good teammate. I think he's a great teammate as well. Just sensible, smart on the ball, and I think he shows his class at times. You you you, you don't see. I've not seen a £35 million price tag on him yet, sadly, but you can kind of start to understand why he went for that sort of money just when you see him in comparison to some of the other players. He just does have something about him, and hopefully the more he plays, uh, we'll get to see more of it. That's something I've been impressed with, with the new signings. Uh, too many times, David, we've brought guys in, particularly in January, and it's mm. taken six, eight weeks or so to actually get them playing and get anything out of them. These guys have come in and started actually contributing and looking in place right away. And I guess that comes down to what the manager's doing with them as well. Someone who's maybe going under the radar a wee bit, um, it struck me at the weekend, is John Suter, who has been featuring quite a lot lately. You know, I think it's it's quite clearly him and Balogun in, in the rotation there next to Goldson. And uh, he he has been really solid recently, I think. Um, it's never been about talent for me with John Suter. It's always been about availability because he's he's clearly a very good defender. Again, doesn't mean that you know he he doesn't have weaknesses. I think he can still get caught under a ball uh, a wee bit too often. But he has been very dependable lately, and I thought that was another good performance from him at the weekend. Yeah, he's when I think about John Suter now, I don't think about injuries and availability anymore. Um, which I guess is a is a massive step forward for him because for his first year or so, that was the first thing that always came to mind. And for me, it's not really anymore. It's more reliability. He does come in. He he doesn't put a foot wrong. Our defensive record this season has been remarkably good and he's played his part in that. He, he had a great moment at the weekend, I think, after I mean, Goldson lost the ball and air counter-attacked. It was him that kind of raced back and he won the ball with a great tackle. And that was a game where he wouldn't have been expected to do that. There was no other instances of that in the game, but he was ready, he was alert, and he sniffed out the danger and sorted it. And that's what he does. He's really good. In, I think he's quite good defensively uh, with headers. He's good going forward. He's got that height in the box as well. He's just... He's a good player to have in our three or four options we've got at centre back, and that's what we're going to need in a title race. Leon Balogun gets injured; he, he's got his issue with his face just now. He drops out. Um, Suter comes in, and we continue the clean sheets. That's kind of the dream, isn't it? One out, another yeah. one, comes out and you don't notice a difference, really. No, that, that's exactly what you need. And I, again, I go back to something the manager's done, which is is making people feel involved and ready because they are going to be used. They know that it's not a case of well, there's that 11 or 13, 14 that, that get picked and we're only in if there's injuries. You know, I, I think that they all know that there's a part to play. A couple of guys who were getting criticism after the weekend. Um, first one I want to discuss is Nico Raskin. And I, I, I did note this from some of our podders as well, and, and it sparked a bit of debate among us so uh I, I think it's it's fair that it's going on among the wider support as well because we're fairly typical of the Rangers support and I think that you know he hasn't been great lately he is coming back from an injury but I think there is a suggestion from some that I do find hard to argue with that he needs to impose himself on games more now I, I do cut him some slack at the moment because he is returning after what was actually quite a lengthy layoff so there is that but with his ability, I do agree that he could be grabbing hold of games in the middle of the park, much in the way Lundstrom has been doing recently. Yeah. Now, Diamandis arrived in, he played in a slightly different position at the weekend, really just to, to, to get time in his legs. You can see already that he's he's a good player technically, you know, he's got good touch and movement and whatnot. So it's quite exciting in that regard. For Raskin to, to, to stay in the team, I think he's got to be imposing himself more in games, Colin. And as I say, I do cut him a little bit of slack at the moment. But moving forward between now and the end of the season, I think it's vital for him to really play a significant role in this Rangers side. He needs to, he needs to really stamp for me, David, what his job is in the team and what he actually offers because he does have the ability. He's, we saw that when he first signed. He's got all the skills. He's played, went away and played with Belgium. He just doesn't impose himself on that midfield enough. And yeah, maybe a lot of that is down to John Lundstrom. I think John Lundstrom does a lot of the things that Nico Raskin would quite like to be doing. And maybe there's not a space for both of them together. Maybe they're too similar in the way that they both want to be playing. Um, I, I don't well, and know it's what... not a debate then about who gets picked, if, if that but, is the case. 
not yeah, not at the moment, sadly, because John, well, sadly for Nico Raskin, because yeah. John Lundstrom has been playing absolutely fantastic since the manager came in. Up with Butland as the MVP, probably. Um, since the manager came in, um, I'd be I'd be surprised at this point now if John Lundstrom doesn't get another contract. Um, I think he's probably earned it now. But for Raskin, he he does just need to show us what he can do, and basically, and maybe I, I don't want to use the, the sort of old cliches announce himself as a Rangers player or I think he needs a moment David he needs something to kick on from and show what he's all about and what he can do because at the minute he's just in games and if you ask somebody what did Raskin do today he was neat and tidy yeah that's it passes. that's it yeah that is exactly it that someone said to me well name me games you've come out saying he was brilliant today and I hibs away when we won 4-1 last year and bar that I was struggling and that's maybe unfair and people will listen to this and say, well, David, there was this and this and this and that's fair. But I think he needs to be, he, he needs to take more care when he's in possession. I think he can be loose with his passing and the ability is there, but I think he needs to to tighten that up a great deal. And Lundstrom has done it, by the way. Lundstrom at the start of the season, I thought, was was loose in his, his possession. So it can be done. Um, but yeah, I would agree with you and, and obviously with Diamandi coming in, it's more competition so he will need to kick on a level call maybe there was a complacency of, well if I'm fat I'm going to get picked, I don't know um, but yeah, definitely and another one, uh, and it was actually a listener asked me about this, was was Scott Wright and he said that's four managers now have seen something in Scott Wright that fans don't seem to see what are we missing? And I think that's a legit point because he's right. That's four managers who've come in and, and every single time Wright gets put back into the side, whether he's been in out of the picture or whatever, and he does get put back in. My theory on it is that Wright is, first of all, he's a you know, very good trainer, obviously. Um, a good lad as well. Doesn't give you any issues. Works his nuts off in training. Secondly, he's very, very good out of possession. And when a manager comes in and wants to instill a shape into a side, that is important. That's one of the first things a manager does. And Wright is very coachable in that sense, that if you tell him to be in certain spaces, he he is. He's bright and he knows where to be. The issue as fans then comes because we then say, yeah, but what are you doing when we have the ball? And that's where it falls down for me with Scott Wright. And that's generally why, after a few months, he does tend to find his chances limited. I think you can already see, although he's being used, when push comes to shove in the bigger matches, it's Ross McCausland that's getting that shot. It absolutely is, and it should be. Um, Scott Wright, like you say, good trainer. He does what the manager tells him. He's done what four managers in a row have told him. He sticks to the game plan. He doesn't go out there and go rogue ever. He sticks to the plan, and managers like that. They like that reliability. He recently just went over the 100 games um, mark for us, which I, I remember being quite surprised at when I saw it. Um, he's, he's got this myth about him, but about Hamden Wright, doesn't he, and how he, he always puts on a show there. He needs to start doing more than that if he wants to, to keep playing for Rangers. I think he's he's just we've progressed so much since he came in, and the general ability around him has increased. And I don't think he has. I don't think he's that much better a player now than he was when he signed. And I think if we want to keep progressing and moving to the next level and winning titles, winning cups, doing well in Europe, Scott Wright is just not there for me, David. Sadly, great guy, great trainer, a lot of time for him. But I just don't think he's progressed as a Rangers player in the time he's been with us. He was almost out the door in the summer, remember? Um, but it didn't mm. happen. He, he hung around and he has made appearances, he has contributed. But I just I think I need more, especially from the position he plays in. That position's so important. Oh, yeah, that's such key. a creative yeah. one. You need the end product on it, and that's what you don't get from him, sadly. Good touches. He can make a decent pass. He can win balls as well. He's quite strong. But there's just not enough end product from him. And when you come against the defences we come up against where every bit of creativity is important we've seen that with young Ross McCausland how good he is at coming forward and cutting in and being aggressive in the attack that's where Scott Wright falls down for me so I don't like um, bagging on any Rangers player really but he's one I think you'd be looking to probably move on at season end and improve on Yeah like I say you mentioned there's something that managers like managers like control and Scott Wright helps with that because he, he is exactly where the manager wants him to be. But as fans, you're right, he's, a, he's an attacker. 
and his numbers aren't anywhere near what they should be um, mm-hmm. for a, a player in that position for Rangers. Wednesday night, Rangers have the chance to go to the top of the league. Uh, a 3-0 victory against Ross County would be enough to see us get that. And I asked the manager in the press conference at the weekend if that was something that the, the players were thinking about. And he said, nope, for us, it's just three points. doesn't matter where we are now. Um, it's where we are in May. You know, the usual kind of answer you would expect, to be honest. But uh, as fans, I've been thinking about this the significance of it and it struck me Colin as I was sort of looking ahead and getting excited about this game this is the first time since 2010-11 that Rangers will have gone to the top of the league in the business end of a season now I know people will say but David we won the league in 2021 yeah but we ran away with it we we were league leaders from early in the season and we never looked back this is the first time where we've been behind and have an opportunity, as I say, towards the end of the season. There's still a long while to go, but to actually get on top. And when you think about it, Colin, that's well over a decade since we've been able to do that. We haven't been in this position because you, you're right. You've mentioned there there are years where we've fallen apart after after the the new year, or the likes of last year, even though we were winning, Celtic maintained the distance that was already there. In this case, this is different, and that's why I think it does feel so important to us as fans. Now, don't get me wrong, if Rangers win 1-0, then that's fine, because it is about points, right? It really is. Just keep getting the points, and we'll see what happens. But the psychological carrot of being able to do this for the first time, as I say, since 10-11... That's why it's huge for supporters. Um, and again, if it was maybe Aberdeen we were playing or Hearts or someone of that ilk, but the fact that it is Ross County who've been very, very, very poor this season, then that's why the fans are dreaming of let's go and put on a real show and make a real statement. Yeah, so first and foremost, the, the manager is spot on with how he's answered that question. That is how the manager should certainly be addressing that and answering it in public anyway. But you and I, David, are not the Rangers manager. We are, first and foremost, Rangers fans. And we are allowed to look at this game a little bit differently and to start to dream and start to think about potential possibilities. And it is huge. Like you said, it's 10 years since we were in this position. Um, It's a huge, huge thing. There's there's a lot of people going to Ibrox just now that have never really experienced a title race like this. And there's a hell of a lot more that have maybe forgotten a little bit what it's going to be like and how tense and how nervous some of these matches are going to be. So if we get an opportunity on Wednesday to go clear at the top of the league, it's massive. It's massive for our players to experience that and to get that feeling. Uh, whether they'll admit it or not, it's going to be huge for them. to do like We're sitting here, now it's up to somebody else to knock us away from here. For us, we'll start to celebrate, we'll be delighted, we'll galvanise, hopefully the team on with that. But there's also the flip side of it and that it's been 10 years since we experienced it. It's also been 10 years since our opponents experienced the flip of it and since they actually realised that they were in a race, since they realised that they weren't sitting pretty. And it'll be interesting to see how they react to it as well because as positively as we want to react to it, it's going to be interesting to see how negatively we hope they react to it as well. And that, like I say, is, is what a title race is all about. It's it's going to be an exciting couple of months between now and trophy time and like I said it's it's going to be exciting it's going to be you're going to be looking through the looking through your fingers at times it's going to be tense but hopefully at the end of it we'll be in the right place and Wednesday is very much the start of it hopefully absolutely absolutely and I'm very much looking forward to it I'm looking forward to going and as we say hopefully the side will put on a show I do expect us to win by the required number of goals on the night I think that's a great incentive for the side but uh, the fans will turn up in a a good mood ready for it and looking forward to it and you know at the end of the day manager spot on you don't win titles in February but we've been out of titles in February before and that's the difference this year, where we're not requiring snookers, we're not looking at 
you know, we can't slip up at all or any of that stuff. We're looking at it and saying, you know, if we just keep doing what we're doing, then come the end of the season, we've every right to be confident we're going to be crowned league champions. Right then, folks, that will do us for this week on Heart and Hand. Cammy will be back with Heart and Hand Extra on Thursday, where he'll go through the Ross County game and look ahead to the weekend's fixture. My thanks to our executive producers, Mike Lee and Paul Miles, and my thanks to Colin for wonderful guesting today. Uh, always a pleasure, mate. Thank you again. A wee reminder that if you're going to be in London next month, we will be there as well on the 21st of March at the Leicester Square Theatre, where we'll be having a Heart and Hand live show with special guest Paul Gascoigne. If you'd like to attend that, then just Google Leicester Square Theatre Gascoigne and the ticket link will pop straight up and you can come along. Not many left, so if you want to come along, then please get your ticket now. Thanks for listening to us. You can, of course, hear much more from us on our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash heart and hand. I'll be back here next Monday. Until then, let's hope for a successful six-point week for Rangers. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.